Howdy. The purpose of this video is to discuss what um, kind of crystallographic lattices uh, are available in two dimensions. And this is a step towards talking about two-dimensional plane groups. Uh, we need to combine what are the available point groups in two dimensions, the plane point groups, and what are the available lattices in two dimension, and how can we combine those together to form the 17 plane groups. Um, so again, we're talking about lattices today, and the available lattices are restricted due to the existence of rotation axes and uh, reflection planes of symmetry. So in general, uh, if we have a lattice point, we can describe a two-dimensional crystallographic lattice by a combination of two uh, lattice translation vectors. So I'll say T1 and T2. And in the most general case, we have no restriction on these other than the fact that they are not uh, parallel to each other. Um, and so uh, any integral number of lattice combinations away, I will find a new lattice point. Um, and so T1 plus T2 would bring me here. Um, and I can fill up all of two-dimensional space by repeating this original lattice point uh, indefinitely. Another way to say this is that any uh, lattice point can be described as an integral number of combination of these translation vectors. So this is 2t1 plus t2. Gets us from the uh, original lattice point to this new lattice point out here. So in the absence of any rotation uh, axes or any mirror planes of symmetry, the most general two-dimensional lattice type that we can have uh, is composed of parallelograms. And so this shape right here is a parallelogram. And just as a reminder, that means we have um, two pairs of parallel lines. So there's a pair of parallel sides here and a pair of parallel sides here. Uh, there's no restriction on these angles. So this is the first kind of plane lattice we can have, uh, a parallelogram. Okay, so let's think about what happens if I start introducing um, two-dimensional rotation axes. If I introduce a two, uh, sorry, <laughs> two-fold rotation axes, if I introduce one on the lattice point, um, I would necessarily have one on the other last point. And remember previously, we generate a new two-fold rotation axis um, that actually is halfway along this lattice point, and it's sitting on the lattice vector. And the same thing would happen here. This uh, two-fold rotation axis would be translated up to this last point, and I would have another two-fold rotation axis along that translation vector. And these two-fold axes would be, you know, recurring throughout uh, throughout uh, all two dimensions, um, but these are entirely consistent with a parallelogram lattice. So again, introducing a two-fold rotation axis does not uh, introduce any particular constraints on this angle here. All that we uh, the the main constraint is that instead of just a single two-fold rotation axis. I have new two-fold rotation axes um, situated along the bisectors. And again, that comes from uh, applying this theorem that we discussed previously. So that's one case. Um, what about if we work with three-fold rotation axes? And now uh, we've already seen that if I have a lattice, um, a single translation vector here, then this rotation, this original uh, rotation axis, let's call it A sub alpha, will bring this new rotation axis, and it'll rotate it by three, uh, two pi over three radians up here, and I can have translation vector, translation vector, they will repeat, and in addition, I have new rotation axes that occur uh, inside the unit cell. So I see, I already see a unit cell here. I'm going to draw the uh, 
subdivide it just to see it more clearly, composed of two equilateral triangles that are sharing a side. Um, and this is described as a rhombus. This is a 120 degree rhombus where this angle here is 120 degrees. This length, if I call it L, is the same as this length. This is 120 degrees. These are each 60 degrees. So this is a 120 degree rhombus lattice. Um, and that is uh, our next uh, kind of lattice that we're going to see. And again, because we have these threefold rotation axes on uh, the corners, we know that we also have threefold rotation, rotation axes inside uh, because we apply uh, this uh, theorem, which tells us what happens when we combine a rotation axis and a translation. Now, we, I'm going to skip ahead to a sixfold because we see a very similar pattern when we have a sixfold uh, rotation axis. So I'm just going to quickly draw out what it looks like and then explain how we get here. But again, we're going to see this 120 degree rhombus. In this case, uh, this uh, original rotation axis here, it can be translated over to a new rotation axis. But then it is rotated up by pi over 3 radians, rotated over here, rotated here, and a combination of that sixfold and those translation vectors can fill up all space. And again, we're going to see this 120 degree rhombus. Um, however, there are additional rotation axes. Um, this sixfold is going to map onto uh, this sixfold, so we already see that one. But remember, a sixfold rotation axis is uh, also contains within it a threefold rotation axis and a twofold rotation axis. Uh, and when you work with those, you're going to see that we have twofold rotation axes um, along the bisectors between these sixfold rotation axes and along this one. And then we're going to see a threefold rotation axis uh, in the middle within that unit cell. Um, but again, this is just that 120 degree rhombus lattice. So so far, we've only seen two potential lattices. Um, it is worth pointing out that you know a 120 degree rhombus is an example of a parallelogram, but it's a special parallelogram because it has additional constraints. And so that's why we give it a new name. So the uh, square, or the fourfold rotation axis, is going to lead to a new uh, two-dimensional lattice. And we can see that if we draw a fourfold rotation axis, a lattice vector, a new fourfold rotation axis. This original axis is going to operate on the new one, rotate it pi over two radians up here, um, and it will be again translated. And all of these lengths are going to be um, the same. So if this is L, this is also L, this is also L. This is also L. So this is giving us a square lattice. <clears throat> now we can't stop here because uh, the existence of this fourfold rotation axis implies a new fourfold rotation axis in the center, uh, as well as uh, twofold rotation axes along the bisectors of these lattice vectors. So these are three of the five kinds of lattices we can have. The other two <coughs> are obtained when we combine uh, reflection planes with translation, uh, and they are the rectangular lattice and the centered rectangular lattice. And to understand uh, why we get these two new lattices, we're going to introduce another theorem. And that is uh, when we combine a mirror plane and a translation vector, we're going to generate a new mirror plane at half of the length of the translation vector. Uh, and we can see this pretty clearly. Let's uh, make a mirror, mirror plane here. And let's have some translation vector like so. And so I know that I'm going to have a mirror plane down here. 
and this is the original mirror plane that has been translated. And if I consider starting off with a uh, general position, it will get uh, reflected across mirror plane one. I'm going to call this mirror one prime. Uh, it'll be reflected across mirror plane one. And both of these will be translated down. So I have that same general position, which is related to uh, the original general position by a translation vector. And I have the uh, reflected general position, which is related uh, to this original reflected uh, general position, again, by a translation vector. But what we can see already is that um, combining that mirror plane and that translation vector, I have generated a new mirror plane in between the two. So this is M2. I guess in my original notation, I'm calling this M1. Let's just call this M2 prime, just to make everything consistent. Um, so this, uh, again, is going to impose constraints on how these translation, translation vectors can be oriented. And the way to think about this is that if I have a mirror plane and a lattice point, which is repeated by my translation vector down here, and let's repeat it a couple times down here, down here. I have mirror planes passing through each of these lattice points and a mirror plane here. And again, uh, because of this theorem, we have mirror planes at the halfway points. So this is a single translation vector, which I have in uh, an orthogonal direction to the mirror planes. If I want to expand this into two dimensions, I want to do that without generating uh, an infinite number of mirror planes. And so really there are only two ways that I can do that that are consistent uh, with uh, combining mirror planes and translation vectors. And that is, uh, in one case, I can have my translation vector uh, perpendicular to the original translation vector, or I could have a translation vector that maps down to here, T2 prime. And in either of these cases, each of these mirror planes are going to be mapped onto already existing mirror planes. But they're going to lead to two slightly different things. So the first case is going to lead to what we call a rectangular lattice. And it's rectangular because T1 and T2 are perpendicular to each other. In the second case, um, my uh, second um, lattice vector uh, has uh, some component uh, that is aligned along the original lattice vector, and that component is equal to half of the length of the original lattice vector. So the second case is going to give me uh, a new lattice point here, and then another last point here, and this last point is going to be um, on the same mirror plane as this last point. And so if you keep um, propagating these across, what you see is again, we have rectangles, but there is a lattice point in the center of the rectangle. And that is why this is called a centered rectangular lattice. So the general conclusion then is that we have five different kinds of lattices. There's the most general parallelogram, there's a 120 degree rhombus lattice that we see anytime we have threefold or sixfold rotation. We have a square lattice, which uh, has to be there if we have a fourfold rotation. And then we have rectangular and centered rectangular lattices, um, which occur when we have mirror planes. And I can additionally have twofold rotation axes present in these lattices as well. All right, thanks.